might, not by power, by my spirit, says the Lord. Cause every mountain's got to crumble, doubts pass away. God on my side, who can stand in my way, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says. Genesis chapter 4, and we'll start reading at verse 3. Genesis chapter 4, <clears throat> and verse 3. Praise the Lord. Thank God somebody remembered to put water up here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well... Will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. Father, thank you today for your presence. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Give us what we need to be victorious in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. I want to preach to you for a few minutes today on the thought of make yourself do it. Is what the advice that God gave to Cain directly talking to him face to face, person to person. God said to Cain, why is your countenance fallen? Why are you angry? Why are you upset? I rejected your sacrifice. I accepted your brothers. If you do what I ask and give the proper sacrifice, I will accept you as much as anyone else. God doesn't play favorites. God just always is on the level playing field. He's fair. He's kind. He's the same to everyone. Hallelujah. The battles you're going through are not any worse than the battles that anybody else in this church is going through. Your trials are not any greater than anybody else's. You're not so special. All of these things are common to man. And if they are victorious, you can be victorious. If they overcome, you can overcome. We are all called by God, and we all are on the level playing field. And God said to Cain, come on, what's wrong with you? Why are you angry? Why is your countenance down? If you do well... Won't you be accepted? In other words, go back and make a proper sacrifice and you will be doing well and I will accept you. But then he warns, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Another translation said, sin is crouching at your door. Sin is crouching like an animal ready to jump on you and devour you. Sin is right outside the door. You're in the danger zone, Cain. You're, you're in a place where you shouldn't be. This anger is not from me. You are not angry on a right motive. You, you've got a wrong heart and you've got to respond correctly and watch out because sin is waiting to attack and to destroy you. Sin encroaches at your door. If you do well, you're going to be accepted. What did Cain do? He went out and he killed his brother. Why? Because he chose to do wrong. Choose you this day, the Bible says, whom you will serve. Choose to say no to the devil and yes to God. Choose. It all begins with our will. And if we choose the right path, God will honor us and give us the power to fulfill everything. He doesn't expect you to conquer the devil. He'll do it through you. But you still have to choose. Somebody say amen. I like Philippians chapter 3 where it says, And Jesus made himself of no reputation. Make yourself do it. Make yourself. The Father didn't make Jesus become the sacrificial lamb. Jesus made himself 
do that. He made himself lower than the angels. He made himself lower and went as a servant born into the earth. He made himself lower and went to the death of the cross and, and suffered horribly for us and our sins. He made himself. In other words, we make our destiny by the choices that we make. You can make the right decision and God will come roaring to your side, stand beside you, send angels to guide you, give you the Holy Spirit in your heart. He will make you an overcomer. You can whip a mountain if you get in the right position with God. We have to choose. Jesus made himself. And I think it's a day in which we live in which we're going to have to make ourselves. We're going to have to serve God on purpose. We're not, we can't serve God by accident. We can't just go to church when we want and suddenly we're going to be in the, the gates of heaven. I think the trials that are ahead for this nation and for us individually are going to push us either out the door of Christianity or into a new place with God. There's going to come in a separating of the tares and the wheat, a separation from those that are casual and those who are committed. I said those who are casual and those who are committed. The Spirit of God is in jealously, earnestly trying to get you to wake up spiritually and to choose Him. Make yourself do it. Hallelujah. Do it on purpose. Hallelujah. I hate what people say. Well, I'm just not feeling it. Well, you're not supposed to feel it with the things of God. You're supposed to obey the Word of God. It's not supposed to be comfortable and tidy and casual and careless and tiptoeing through the tulips. It's a, it's a war you're in. You put on your armor and you fight the good fight of faith and you hold up the shield of faith and, and you resist the devil with your mouth and you claim your victory. You're in a war and the devil is turning up the heat and it's time for God's people to get closer to God, to make ourselves make the right decision. How many times has God spoken to each of you over things he desires for you but you won't make yourself obey? You disobey. You say, well, it's not that important. Honey, if God tells you to do it, it's important. He doesn't speak just to hear his self talk. He says what he wants for your life. He ordains a path for us. He says this is right and this is wrong. Well, everybody else does it, but that you're not everybody else. Hallelujah. Joyce Meyer said she told the Lord one time when he was telling, correcting her and giving her, she said, but Lord, other preachers do that. Other preachers say this. And the, and the Lord said to her, Joyce, you've asked me for a lot of things. Do you want it or not? Do you want it or not? If we're going to make people around us be the judge of what our level of Christianity is, we may not even make it to heaven. You've got to put your eyes up into the hills. You've got to put your eyes up to the throne of God. you got to put your eyes up to the bleeding sacrifice of Jesus. You got to get your eyes on the Lord and say Lord I want to obey you. Somebody say amen. And whatever you say Lord I will obey. I'll do it on purpose. I'll do it even if it hurts. I'll do it even if my flesh doesn't like it. I'll obey you regardless. Hallelujah. Nothing works like obedience saints. Hallelujah. Jesus made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation. Do you obey the things that God says? Do you make yourself obey God? Well, pastor, you know, you've served God for so many years. You, you, you must not get God roughing you up and telling you this and that and telling you what's right and wrong. Oh, no. God tells me every day. And most of them are new things. Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> There was one television show that I like to watch and I record it, I keep it recorded and I watch it and, and it's not dirty, it's not don't use bad language or anything, but I just like this show. And uh, not long ago I was praying and the Lord, when I got done praying and the Lord had patted me on the shoulder and hugged me and kissed on me and I, I felt so accepted and so loved to the Lord. And I was walking out the door and he said, oh, by the way, drop that show from your repertoire. I don't want you to ever look at it again. I heard that as I was going out the door. I, I thought, well, I thought we were having a love fest here. I thought we were in love. Come on, you, you were hugging on me. He said, I just decided that you're not going to do that anymore. Don't watch it anymore. And I haven't. And I'm not. And you can't make me. 
you put the show on in front of me, I'll close my eyes. I'm not going to disobey God no matter what. Come on. We got to have some lines drawn in our life. We got to have some yeses and noes. We got to have some black and white in our life. We need to follow what the Lord says. Not because we agree with it, not because we like it, because I can tell you, nothing that God says to your flesh will your flesh agree with. Your flesh will argue and debate and whine and try to get out of it but just get yourself by the nap of the neck and say, no, I'm going to obey God. I've come too far down this road of salvation to give up and and to fall out in the way. Now I'm going to make it all the way to the end. I'm going to hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm not about to abdicate my position. I'm going forward, forward, forward in the name of the Lord. Somebody say amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Paul said, I beat my body and bring it into subjection. That's a pretty graphic word. I beat my body. When they're preaching today, it doesn't matter what you do in your body as long as your heart's right. That's error from hell. Paul said, I beat my body and bring it into subjection. Oh, well, he just meant that because he could attain a higher level. Well, that's not what the rest of the verse says. The rest of the verse says, lest I myself should become a castaway. Look it up in the Greek, what castaway means. Doesn't have anything to do with reward. It has to do with your soul being in heaven or hell. I'm going to bring my body into subjection. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. We're a a generation that's addicted to comfort. (laughs) <laughs> we don't want to endure. We don't want to go against the grain. We don't want to swim upstream. You can't reproduce. You can't hatch eggs if you don't swim upstream and lay the eggs. Salmon would cease as a fish if they didn't swim upstream. There was no way to make the f- way for the future generation. Amen. We run from it if it's not easy. Paul said, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. Jesus said, you want to be my disciple? Here's the first thing. Deny self. (laughs) Deny self. Deny self. Everybody say, deny self. self. Learn to tell yourself no. Learn to tell yourself yes when he needs to hear yes. Paul said in one place, I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them that dung, but I may preach Christ. Somebody say amen. Some of us are stalled out spiritually and not moving forward because we won't answer the hard questions that God is putting to us. Few kings in the Old Testament removed the high places. The high places were the, were the mark that God put up there. And when they would go up to worship Baal and Ashtaroth and all those gods, they would, they, they would go to the high places. They'd put them on the highest hills. And very few of the kings, even the righteous ones, would remove the high places. They would install temple worship in Jerusalem, but they'd leave the people to have on the mountaintops worship to Baal and Ashtaroth and sacrifice their children up there. They would sacrifice their kids to Molech on the tops of those mountains. A few of those kings went up there and desecrated all the high places and said, no, we're not going to do it. But I think it's still the same principle today. Few people take on the high places. Few people really challenge themselves and take a hard look at themselves and say, search me, oh God, and know my heart. That's why I thank God for this church and the Holy Ghost. Our sister that visits every few months said she walked in today and she felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I thank God that the Holy Ghost is here. The Holy Ghost is in this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn around and look at somebody and say, the Holy Ghost is here. Hallelujah. He's in this house and he, he alone, he alone will help you to clean out the high places. He alone will expose the darkness and the wickedness in our hearts. Uh, We don't know our own hearts. We think we're good and we're sweet and we're kind, but we're not. The Bible says we're, we're, we're full of iniquity and desperately wicked. We, we need somebody to look at us that's, that's not us and to tell us all the ways of man are right in his own eyes. Proverbs says, but we have to know that God is calling us. Somebody say amen. 
So go after the high place in your life. What's your high place? What's the one thing that, 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 that bothers you, that hand, hinders you, that, that, that's there? Well, I challenge you to move forward, make yourself do it, and knock that thing off. It. Somebody say amen. <laughs> you know, when God called Abraham out of Ur Chaldees to go across the, the river and to be his man, uh, history says that his dad, Abraham's dad, was an idol maker. And that Abraham went in before he left and knocked down the big shrine that his dad had of a god. Knocked it over and broke it. And the next day, his dad came in and said, Oh, who desecrated my god? And Abraham was supposed to have said, He's a god, let him speak for himself. Let him tell you who knocked him over. He said, you know very well he's just a stone. He said, then why are you worshiping him? And Abraham left. He already decided the high places weren't going to be his high places. Somebody say amen. Nobody but Jesus is going to rule in the high place of our life. Somebody say praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap for this. This is what we needed from the Holy Ghost. This is what God gave me for us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Some of us are stalled out, not moving forward because we won't answer the questions. What about the high places? Or how about the vessels that Paul talked about in his writings to the church? Some of them are common use, you know, and they're, they're made out of wood and stone. And then some are used for honorary use, and they're made out of gold and silver. And he said, you decide which vessel you're going to be. You decide if you're going to be wood or if you're going to be gold. You decide. He said, if any man will cleanse himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you understand that? The more you come into him, the more he honors you and makes you a gold or silver vessel. The more honor he gives to you. Oh man, I tell you, my heart is burned all week with this message because it's playing out in my life. I want to be a vessel of gold and silver to the Lord. I want the Lord to honor me. I don't want to be just for common use. I want to be for the special use of the kingdom of God. Somebody say amen. Now turn with me to the book of Nehemiah. Those of you who got scriptures, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 13. And I'm going to read to you something about, about the desperateness of serving God and making yourself do it and doing the right thing and being pleasing to God that, that we're supposed to put everything else aside in order to be what God wants us to be. You know, and, and uh, this is such a beautiful story. My brother called me yesterday from Florida, who's a pastor, and we were talking about our sermons. And he said, what are you going to preach on tomorrow? And I said, well, I'm studying now Nehemiah chapter 13, where Nehemiah said, I pulled their hair out. I said, I'm thinking about titling the sermon, I Pull Their Hair Out. <laughs> if for nothing else, just shock value. Can you see that going out on our email and our website? I Pull Their Hair Out. What in the world? Has that preacher lost his mind? Preaching on pulling hair out. What does he do? But I, I chickened out at the last minute. And I called it, Make Yourself Do It. Because I didn't know if you could stand it or not. <laughs> but this just shows the level of commitment that God expects out of his people. Amen? Nehemiah 13. Nehemiah is trying to get these people to straighten up and serve God. And we go down in the middle of the chapter some of you are trying to get ahead of me because you want to see where the hair got pulled out. I'll get to it. 
Don't just, don't get ahead of me. Stay with me. I'll get to it here in a minute. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 13. Verse 23. In those days I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Ammon was born out of incest to Lot and his daughter. Moab was the other boy that was born out of incest. And they were a constant enemy to Israel. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. So I contended with them. And cursed them. And struck some of them. This is a tough preacher. This is a tough leader. Nehemiah was dedicated to God. And pulled out their hair. And made them swear by God, saying, You should not give your daughters or wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. He tells why in verse 26, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. Should we then hear of you doing all this same thing? Transgressing against our God by marrying these pagan women? Solomon, our king, lost out with God, brought destruction to the land. The kingdom was divided because of his sin. He acted the part of a fool because he married strange women. And here you are doing the same thing. Whack. Here you are doing the same thing. Rap. Here you are doing the same thing. There's a curse going to be pronounced over your life. You're making a lifestyle choice that's going to curse you. And I don't want you to be cursed. I want you to make it with God. You say, these are extreme things that are happening. Let me tell you something. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Better to go to heaven with missing body parts than to go to hell with all of your facilities. That's Jesus. That's the Lamb of God, the one that loves us and just wants us to be... We just, I just want you blessed. But I don't want you to commit adultery. I don't, I don't want you to lust after women. I don't want you to marry someone outside your faith because they'll take you away from God. You'll lose your marriage and you'll lose your soul and your kids will be lost forever because you made a stupid decision. Somebody say amen. When I came to Tulsa the first time, I spied Brenda out in the audience and I liked what I saw. I looked and I said, there's a fine looking woman. And so after church, I asked my aunt, who was the pastor's wife, that girl in the orange sweater, she's pretty foxy. I think I might want to date her. Yeah, she's already dating the drummer in the church, Bobby. I thought, no problem, I'll move Bobby out. I think they're engaged even. I thought, no problem. That can be fixed. I said, but I have one question. Where is she with God? I want to know. Does she come once a month? Once a week? Is she involved in ministry? My aunt went down the litany. She teaches Sunday school class. Oh, there you go. She's always in the altar. She prays. And her parents are backslidden, and they won't come to church, but she scoops up her brother and sister every Sunday and brings them to this church. I thought, wow. There's somebody that's dedicated to the Lord. There's somebody I might be able to make a life with because the ministry demands 100%. 
Somebody say amen. Oh, she sure is pretty. She's in church. Yeah, but does she love the Lord? You call the altar call, does she go to prayer? No, she gets her compact out. She puts on her makeup. No, you don't want that. Come on. You want somebody that's red hot, on fire, sold out? Somebody say amen. Actually, she wasn't engaged to Bobby when that happened because six months before I got there, the Lord spoke to her in an audible voice on a Sunday service and said, break up with Bobby. Audible voice. And she broke up with him and gave him his ring back. And he cried like a baby and said, why? I thought we were going to get married. She said, I don't know. I don't know. God said no. See, God was, had her put in the reserve slot for me. Yeah, that's right. That's right. God, God put her over on the sidelines and let her sit there till I got there six months later. My brother-in-law kids me. He says, listen, when that 150 pounds of walking romance hit Tulsa, Brenda was never the same. That's what I weighed. It's hard to believe I weighed 150, but I did. But it wasn't the walk and romance that got her. It was the will of God for her life. And that she had already dedicated herself to I won't marry this person if it's not God's will. How dare you make decisions that will affect the rest of your life and don't even pray about it one time? Don't even talk to the God of heaven and ask his opinion? Amen. Amen. My brother and I have some financial decisions to make on my mom's estate. And we spent time yesterday and we talked about all the ramifications and all the choices and the conclusion of it. We both came to the same conclusion. We need to just go to God in prayer. And we need to take a month and just seek the Lord. And whatever the Lord says, that's what we want to do. Because I don't know in a month from now if the banking system will be here. And neither do you. But the God that I serve knows whether the banks are going to be open. The God that I serve knows what to do with the money. The God that I serve knows the right choices to make. And he said, I'll never leave you. I'll open the doors and I'll close the doors. Don't you want him to guide you and to lead you and to help you? Praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So I think God is saying to us today, live by faith, live by choice, persevere, hold on, keep believing, keep standing. Somebody say amen. One of the men in our church had a dream one night. And he said, I, was, I had a 10-pound sledgehammer, and I'd been hitting this wall. And he said, I knew that eventually there was going to be a hole and that the glory of the Lord was going to come through that. And he said, you weren't wasting your time. And he said, every time the sledge hit, the Lord said to this man, that's his prayer life. And it's a, it's a, he said, my word is like a sledge. It's like a hammer that breaks. And he said, he just keeps on hitting, keeps on hitting, keeps on hitting because there's a breakthrough coming. The glory of the Lord is going to break through. Somebody say, man, God's going to come with power like we've never seen before. We're going to see things like we've never seen. But you got to keep hitting. You got to live by faith not your feelings. And he said, I looked at your hands and you had tape wrapped around your hands because there were blisters and calluses and you were losing protection, but you kept going and kept going. And he said, the Lord said, he doesn't see anything changing, but look at the other side of the wall. And he said, suddenly I was on the inside and I saw that wall 
plaster was falling off, lath was falling down, boards were broken on the inside. It was a mess. But on the outside, it looked the same. But on the inside, damage was everywhere. He said, you were being effective, but you didn't know it. Except that God said, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep going. Keep striking. Keep praying. Somebody say amen. amen. How many prayer revivals have we had? Huh, dozens and dozens and dozens through all these years. Three weeks ago, we had another prayer revival. You all came out great. We had a lot of people here for the size of our church every night. We had people coming, praying, seeking God. On Friday night of the prayer revival, we walked outside, and I looked at the clock at my watch, and it was 8.03. We had just prayed around the altar and walked out those doors. I was standing there by my car when a violent earthquake hit. How many of you were here on Friday night? You felt that. And I didn't think anything of it. I just looked and said, oh, it's 8.03. That strange earthquake hit right at the end of the prayer meeting. The next morning I went over here to prayer and the Holy Ghost, first thing he said to me, by the way, that was me last night. And I got goosebumps that broke out all of my arms when the Lord said that. That was me last night. And I said, why? He said, I wanted to come by and give the church another sign. I'm pleased. They're effective in their praying. And it's going to happen just like I said. It's going to happen just like that quake. Suddenly, without warning, quickly, and it's going to change the spiritual landscape forever. It's going to be so big. And it's going to hit when you're not expecting. So quick. My wife was standing inside. She said she looked at those glass panels on the balcony and they were popping back and forth. She thought they were going to break. They were popping so violently. It was a violent hit. I felt the earth go down under my feet. And I thought at first, my God, what is this? Just the earth went boom and then it came back up. Boom! And those windows are going like that. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And last night I was sharing with one of our prayer warriors after prayer about that experience. And the Lord spoke to me and said, not only that, you missed one other aspect of this. And I said, what? He said, the violent. It's going to be violent. It's going to do violence to the kingdom of hell. It's going to do violence to the powers of darkness. It's going to be a violent thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. Square your shoulders and come out in faith. God is with our people. God is with anybody that's praying and seeking his face. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Then I thought about other pictures that God has given us, illustrations of the coming of the glory. One of the big ones is a tsunami. And when the tsunami comes, there's such violence, such violence that one in Indonesia changed those islands. It moved one island eight feet. Eight feet! It hit with such force. Hallelujah. God's getting ready to mess this world up. God's getting ready to mess your hair up. Don't make the Holy Ghost pull your hair out. Just let him mess it up. Get your mind where it ought to be and be, get spiritual and be pressing in because things are about to change. Stand with me. Praise the Lord. Let's step out from where we are. Stand at the front of this building as a testimony of our faith this morning. God is getting ready to do great and mighty things. God is getting...